So back when I was a little larvesque tonight, my dad really liked baseball. I mean, he still likes it, but he really liked it when I was a kid. He was a huge Yankees fan, he played on a softball team, he just loved it. He always encouraged me in the same way. He'd get me Yankees gear, hats, all that sorts of stuff. He also wanted me to play, so I ended up playing t-ball on some little league team when I was five or six years old, and no, I was not good. I'd play in the outfield and get really distracted by the dandelions and grass and stuff. Not bugs, god. No, but yeah, I wasn't really paying attention at all. Even though I wanted to like the sport because my dad did and he was cool, I just didn't. I was bored so easily. Anyway, after one game where I did particularly little, my mom and dad took me and my siblings to go get ice cream, and I was really bored and tired. The drive felt like it took forever. But when we got to the ice cream place, this glorified stall that didn't let people in but just had windows where you could walk up and order, because I had played in the game and because I was the oldest, I was able to get two scoops of ice cream. I was so excited, and I walked up, looked at the flavors, and confidently ordered two of my favorite flavors. One scoop of mint and one scoop of peanut butter. I don't remember hating it, but looking back, I can't imagine it was good. This isn't really a memory that fills me with joy, more so a kind of embarrassing impatience. Anyway, that's pretty much why I can't stand Pow World. Now look, you can see the video time, you know this isn't over, but I figured I'd lampshade the whole video with this story first so you could know, going in, that I did not like this game. It was something I really wanted to love, it had a mix of lots of things that I really enjoyed, and it just never clicked. That's not to say that there's nothing here. There are some genuinely good ideas trapped in this game, things that evolve its very clear inspirations in ways that are really genuinely cool. This game was thoughtfully made in some respects, and hey, it's still an early access alpha release. Maybe it'll get better. I hope so, because as it is right now, this game is a magnificent disaster that I hated as much as I loved. This game is less than the sum of its parts, but those parts are cool enough that it just might be able to salvage the experience for some. I do love mint ice cream after all. Also, it's probably worth noting that my thoughts on Pal World are a little, shall we say, scattered. Putting together this script has been a pretty wild experience, and playing through this game has sent me hurtling through moments of genuine delight and into the depths of frustration and disappointment with reckless abandon. I've tried to organize my thoughts for this video, but it's still going to be a little bit more unhinged than usual. Not necessarily a bad thing, maybe it's even suitable for this somewhat unhinged game. Finally, just one more note. This whole video is just my opinion, and my opinion alone. If you don't agree with my opinions or you think I'm wrong, that's totally cool. I just wanted to share my thoughts and feelings on this bizarre game that's captivated the internet's attention, and mine. Okay, cool, Illy, here we go. I'm Volcaronite, and today we're looking at Pal World. Cheap knockoff or next evolution? So let's start off with the obvious primary inspiration. This game is clearly, clearly inspired by Pokemon. And yup, it's all over. It's difficult to argue that any game where you fight and catch monsters of any kind is not inspired by Pokemon. But let's be honest here, this game basically takes designs and mechanics straight from Pokemon often enough that I wouldn't be uncomfortable calling some of these designs and features ripoffs. Need convincing? Here's the very first Poke- er, pal in your pal deck. This is Lamball, and I want you to look at it. Really absorb Lamball. Take it in and make sure you understand this design. Cool. Now here's Wooloo, a Pokemon from 2019. They're basically the same design. So similar, in fact, that I actually reversed the two's art on you and, be honest with me, did you even notice? If you did, was it only because of how much the internet obsessed over Wooloo when it was announced? Here's the pal Tansy and the Pokemon Pansage. Tfint and Fanpy, Vixie and Kremis, both knockoffs of Eevee, and on and on and on it goes. This incessant bootleg Pokemon infestation was one of the first things I noticed about this game, but to be completely frank, I actually didn't mind that much. I know it's definitely unoriginal and maybe a little frustrating, but I really like Pokemon, so this actually didn't bother me all that often. In fact, more often than not, I just found myself laughing at the shamelessness of it all. I mean, when this thing drops on you, a fat Electabuzz, I thought it was kind of hilarious. Now, among all the blatant copy-paste designs, the ones that look like Unity stock models and whatever the hell this thing is supposed to be, there were definitely some highlights. My personal favorite pal was Daydream. She's just a cute little guy, she's not too shameless or <clears throat> angled in design. 
Plus, you unlock a mechanic that, if you have her in your party, allows her to just float around with you forever. She even acts as a second attacker whenever you go up against other pals. You can throw out any other pal from your party, but if you're close enough, Daydream will attack too. I actually found myself almost bonding with her. Other favorites include the goofy but adorable King Pekka, the Mega Meganium that is Dynasum, and the Metal as Hell Jet Dragon. But all in all, the designs of these pals were actually one of the highlights of playing the game. When I first booted up the game on a call with some friends, we had a great time finding the new pals and figuring out what Pokemon had been bootlegged to make them. But that's not the only Pokemon element that was stolen. Breeding is a bit different, you literally combine pals in a test tube, but move tutoring still exists in full force. There's even these tutor fruit plants that I just ended up calling TM trees, and the type chart was made from boiling down the Pokemon type chart until it was just salt and stock. I really didn't expect this to be so mundane. All of the types were just copied from Pokemon, and each type has only one weakness and one strength. Well, the neutral type, a uh, renamed normal, the only renamed type, has no strengths, and fire has two. I do think that fire is just the best type because of this, but there's not really any complicated relationships or immunities. I don't think resistance is a thing, and it's all about this wheel of strengths and this line sprouting from fire. It's almost entirely the same as Pokemon, just boiled down to one relationship apiece. So all of this makes it seem like an oversimplified Pokemon. And sure, I definitely had that feeling too at first. But that doesn't take into consideration the combat element of the equation, because battling is not copied straight over. Combat in Pal World isn't turn-based at all. Alright, let's go back to the beginning of my first playthrough. When I was first dropped into the game, I was sort of expecting the Pokemon tutorial. You know the one. You meet the Pokemon professor, your rival, and get a starter Pokemon that allows you to get on with the game. But you need to be given that Pokemon first, or else you can't play. Gotta have a starter, right? Wrong. You and your skirt are awakened in this weird cave building here, and you wander around and collect resources. You can build some sort of crafting bench, eventually tools, but you don't get anything to catch pals. You don't even get a pal at first, but there are pals everywhere, so what are you to do? Well, you wander up to the nearest stuffed chicken and literally start punching it to death. This is not a joke. You engage in hand-to-beat combat with the innocent balloon animals of the world in order to gain some experience levels. Yes, you'll be leveling yourself up as well as your pals. You need to level up in order to craft your pal-catching apparatus. You can craft a Pokebo- uh, I mean, pal sphere, and that lets you capture pals, once you beat them to low HP, of course. You eventually start crafting tools and weapons that you can use to help you on your journey. You get spears, bats, a bow and arrow, and you can more efficiently lower pals HP. You can also send out one of your pals from your party. This feels very Legends Arceus to me. You can creep up to approach a pal, you can throw a pal sphere at the back for a capture bonus. Or if you hit it with one of your own pals, or just start beating it with a pickaxe or something, it'll take more damage. Then, any pal you've sent out into battle pretty much takes care of itself, attacking and running around, while you can also attack the pal. Eventually, you either catch it, which either adds it to your party or sends it to your pal box, or kill it, which allows it to drop some resources. It's all real-time combat, and to be fair, it's actually kind of fun. Every pal attacks and moves a little differently, and there's boss pals, called alpha pals to eviscerate what little ripoffed out remains, scattered across the world that can actually give you a lot of trouble. It took me half a dozen or more tries to take out my first boss pal, a giant ice ferret named, um... Chill it? Is this real? Anyway, this was a pretty tough battle. It's also the mechanic that bonded me to Daydream. After all, it would float around beside me always, and whenever I attacked a pal, it would just get to work. It kind of reminded me of the auto battle feature in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. As you progress through the game, you'll eventually build a pal gear workbench. You won't have anything to do with it yet, but if you've played any of the old Pokemon games, you can consider this bench to be where you unlock your HMs. If not, this will give your pals a suite of special moves and abilities as you unlock them. Throughout the game, you'll be constantly unlocking elements from your technology tree. As you level up your player, you'll get access to technology points, which you can spend in this menu on various devices, features, and upgrades. Among your survival-style workbenches, storage, base building, and some other stuff we'll get to soon, you'll unlock a special device for each of your pals. These devices can be crafted at the Pal Gear workbench in order to unlock your pal's special ability. This is what allows Daydream to float around with you, Daydream's necklace. Like I said, I loved this. Daydream's ability is unique, best as I can tell. Some pals get added weapons, usually in the form of heavy artillery, and some get saddles to ride, allowing you more movement methods as well as more direct control over your pals in battle. 
I do want to steer clear of the traversal benefits for the time being, but the combat mechanics alone are well worth unlocking, especially as you continue to fight the bosses. Let's talk about those bosses. There's three basic types. The first are these world fights called alphas and scattered around the world, marked on your map once you discover them. Then there's these dungeon fights. You stumble onto a cave or an Elden Ring challenge circle and step inside, they're marked on your map the same way. Or there are tower masters. Mechanically, these are all pretty much the same. They involve you and your entire party fighting one single boss pal. The alpha and dungeon bosses give you the opportunity to catch the pals, while the towers act a little differently. The Tower Masters are the main campaign bosses, even though no real campaign exists, but the tutorial box in the corner will stay there until you defeat the first Syndicate Tower, and it's pretty clear about wanting you to continue fighting these. In fact, the Tower Master fights are where the player versus enemy combat feels the most like Pokemon, since you're not just fighting a pal, but a pal's owner slash trainer too. You get these cutscenes as you enter each one, which are really strangely framey every time, and you fight a giant pal being ridden by a Tower Master. Master human. Bizarrely, the Tower Masters appear to be the only non-U humans that own pals, but they're not the only humans in the world. In fact, one of the most common foes you'll face are the legions of each Tower Master, like these syndicate thugs. These humans usually hunt pals in packs, carry guns, and will attack you and your team whenever you approach. Fighting them is mechanically identical to fighting pals, you can even catch them in palace spheres once you unlock stronger options. But the combat is a unique action-y twist on this very rote monster catching cliché. I'll say this much, the Pokemon influence is definitely the best part of Pal World. You don't really train or evolve pals in the same way, they just kind of get XP whenever you do, like if the EXP share applied to smelting iron and watching grass grow, but they do get stronger throughout, and the level curve never felt off to me. Exploring further reaches does grant you some more powerful pals, but there's still plenty of Wooloos and Squavets around to stomp whenever you need to. And while this is definitely the best that Pal World has to offer, there's more inspiration here. And while those inspirations may be a bit more subtle, what they lack in shamelessness, they make up for in crappy execution. Pal World is an open world game, so like every open world game made since 2017, it's got lots of inspiration from Breath of the Wild. The paraglider is basically mandatory, the stamina meter acts in almost exactly the same way, the world construction is pretty much identical, movement options are limited but similar, and the whole world here is climbable in the exact same way Breath of the Wild is. Like the Pokemon inspirations, this shouldn't necessarily be a bad thing, at least on the surface. I like Breath of the Wild, so a game that takes inspiration from it really shouldn't be a problem. And sure, on the surface, this world looks nice. There's plenty of graphical glitches and hiccups, we'll chalk that up to the game being in early access, but what is here is actually relatively decent looking. The game uses the vibrant colors and landscapes really well. Areas like the northern side of the windswept hills are plain gorgeous. Any autumn colored area in a game will have me totally on board. But that's not it. The lighting engine isn't nearly as sophisticated and colorful as the one used in Breath of the Wild or especially Tears of the Kingdom, but it does look nice. Daylight cycles feel really natural, and the ease of using torches is a big plus, since it gets quite dark at night. Some of the pals also emit light. Fox sparks and ruby glow as they sleep. Mount Obsidian also looks great, day and night. And, well, I mean, I wish there was more, but really, when it comes to open world games, there's only one most important feature for me, fun traversal. If an open world is fun to move across, if the act of traveling between points is always enjoyable, then the open world is, in a broad sense, at least well considered. So are the Palapagos Islands, yes that's their real in-world name, fun to traverse? Good. God. No. Moving around this world, at least for the first 10 hours or so of your game, is a brutal slogging nightmare. For starters, everything that you do to move around in this game feels about 50% too slow. Walking is slow, sprinting is so slow. I noticed this almost right away. Moving around the world just feels way slower than it has any right to. Your character doesn't have a lot of momentum as they move, which makes them feel quite light and agile, but their movement throughout the world makes them feel like a tank. This is one of the biggest flaws of this game. This is an open world when you want to be out exploring at almost every opportunity, but I found that my open world navigation instincts would constantly cause me to underestimate the time that it'd take to get to a place by half, maybe more. 
this does have the side effect of making the world feel huge. I don't really regard this as a positive in and of itself, but between your slow movement and the world's generous use of enormous hills, bluffs, statues, architecture, and bizarre elevation, you do feel the scale of this world on you. Well, you would if the world required you to explore it at all. Moving around this world was so boring and slow that I found myself using fast travel to navigate absurdly small distances. The game's compass and omnipresent Skyrim knockoff that sits atop your screen will point to fast travel structures and a few key points of interest that are within 300 feet. So I'd constantly get into situations where I could still see my home base on the compass, but because a fast travel point was closer, I'd just go there, endure the reasonably short loading screen, and appear at home. The urge to hit the fast travel button is one of my arch nemesis in video gaming. Any wish to skip over the world in an open world game is a failure of the game design. That is always true, but it's especially prevalent in a game like PAL World, where the main gameplay loop is wandering around the world and capturing PALs. Every time I'd rather hit the fast travel button than to wander around and capture PALs, I'm saying that the gameplay is not worth it. Now, even though this is pretty garbage, even those open world games with the worst traversal systems and the most broken fast travel have at least one incentive to explore the world. You need to discover fast travel points in order to use them. And sure, on the face of it, Pal World does seem to require this. Fast travel points may show up on your compass before you even notice them, and they may be close enough that you can see several at a time, but at least you have to discover each one in order to cross the world, right? And you'll go on believing that, until you die the first time. When you do, after waiting for a literal respawn timer to expire, you're kidding me, right? You'll have the opportunity to respawn at either your home base, the start of the game, or any one of a dozen other respawn points scattered across the world. That's right, instead of being tasked with exploring the world, you can empty out your inventory and party, get yourself murked, then appear on the far side of the world. You don't even have to visit these places first, death can just take you there. Each of these respawn points has a fast travel point just a few feet away, so you can cross the world without ever having to step foot in the lands between. Now, you may be saying that I shouldn't be complaining about this. After all, if navigating and exploring is so slow and boring, shouldn't I be thankful that I can skip it? But consider this, if the game's answer to a frustrating mechanic is, as opposed to fixing it or giving the player rewarding tools to make it less frustrating, to just not engage with it, then it calls into question why you're even playing the game. You're yelling at me though, you want me to talk about the mounts and riding pals. So fine, let's chat. As you catch specific pals, you can unlock their special tools in the technology tree, and some of these pals have a saddle as theirs. A pal with a saddle can be ridden using their custom movement and attacks. I was very excited to unlock saddles when I saw them grayed out in the technology tree. It was not long before I was fed up with moving around this game, so I blitzed towards any saddle I saw. The first saddle I unlocked was for Rushor, and it was quite literally slower than walking around. Perhaps I should have expected that, since it's such a low level unlock, but I at least imagined it would be a marginal improvement over walking. But alas, those hopes were pushed over to the next saddle unlocks, Nightwing and Ike Therdeer. I built the Nightwing saddle first and took flight, and it was… well, look, it was okay. It's a lot better than walking, but it's still so slow. I genuinely don't understand why they made travel feel so slow in this game, but it really takes the wind out of your sails. But the real frustration was its incredibly limited stamina. You get about 45 seconds of level flight, or maybe 15 seconds of ascending flight before it has to land and regain stamina. If you start somewhere high up, like the hill at the start of the game, it can be fairly effective, but it was still somewhat disappointing. Ike Theodore had a different set of limitations. This isn't a flying pal, so you're wandering around on the ground, and it's still slower than I would like. It's faster than Nightwing as long as you're not dodging landmarks, and the double jump feature is quite handy. But after I finally was able to catch a dire howl instead of killing them, something that you can do earlier than I did but that I just missed out on, I had a mount that I was happy with the speed of. It's not mind-bending speed or anything, but it finally made exploring not feel like a chore. It only took 10 hours of gameplay to get here. Let's visit Breath of the Wild again. Imagine if, at any point you wanted, you could just stop exploring and, instead, click a button on your screen to appear at the start of the next Divine Beast. You don't need to work your way there, you don't need to discover the world and cross it, you don't need to power up through shrines or get better weapons, just hit the button and appear there. That's basically Pal World's exploration. 
Yes, okay, I hear you. You're yelling at me again. You don't like that comparison. There aren't any pseudo-mandatory dungeons or plot points in PAL world. The respawn points aren't in front of those places because, well, those places don't exist. The respawn points just cut down on time spent crossing the world. But if there's nothing to do except explore to catch PALs, and the respawn feature takes that requirement away, then what's left? Most of this game, or at least most of your moment-to-moment -moment time spent in it, is spent interacting with the survival aspects of the game. All the exploration, if you choose to engage in it, all the Pokemon, all the action-y combat, it all comes second to the survival game mechanics. And it's here where this game shows its cracks the most, because the survival mechanics of this game are so broken and ill-conceived that this game can become basically unplayable. But alright, let's start from the very beginning of the game. You're woken up on a beach, get a cutscene telling you that the towers are the key, and then appear in this decidedly non-beach building. Okay, whatever. From there, you're sent out into the world to collect resources. You punch trees and rocks, eventually build a workstation, craft tools, this is all your usual survival game affair. A lot of your time is spent collecting resources and, like in any survival games, the resource gathering process is the slowest in the early game. Unlike in dedicated survival games like Minecraft and Terraria, where resource gathering is baked into the primary gameplay loop, Pal World is not really interested in the process of gathering what you need. All of your resources are collected in sorts of nodes that sit in place. Trees give you a steady amount of wood and fiber until you've hit them enough that they disappear. Rocks and Paldium, that's its real name, do the same with their materials. They vanish for a little while when you've depleted them, then respawn right in the same place. Tools just speed up this process. They don't change it at all, ever. One of the first workstations you get access to is a PAL box, a sort of half Pokemon PC, half computer terminal that turns a surprisingly large surrounding area into your base. Once you establish your base, you'll be allowed to have a number of PALs wandering around. This number increases as the level of your base increases, yes, you need to level up your base as well, but it's well worth it. The PALs in your base do a couple of things. They eat and sleep so long as you have the proper beds and feeding stations for them, but more importantly, they'll take up tasks around your base. This is important because this is your one and only source of automation in the game. You do build machines, farms, and more complex crafting stations, but this automation is the end goal of the survival aspects of the game. I want you to keep this in mind. Automation in this game is the end goal, and it's the one you'll want desperately because of the nature of those things which are being automated. Those things, building, crafting, operating workstations, are all done in the exact same way. They use the same exact gameplay, if you could even call it that. Let's go on a quick tangent. I have a friend who has a sort of fascination with the gameplay loop, or maybe interaction loop, of idle slash clicker games like Cookie Clicker and Universal Paperclips. I get it, for sure. The human instinct to make number go big exists in all of us, and hey, maybe there's a particular number that you can make go bigger. Anyway, he was interested enough with the clicker format that he decided to recreate the phenomenon as a Minecraft map. He's not alone in this. There's a Minecraft mod pack called One Block that does the same thing. You dig a single block in order to gain resources and upgrade the world. Now, the problem that he ran into is that clicker games are built around the mechanic that one click equals one thing. There's no real time investment required. You just click to increment. In fact, these games are completely designed around this idea that all you have to do is click. They're usually just interfaces, just screens of buttons, all designed to help you feel like the process of make number go big is as player driven as possible without requiring you to dedicate time to it, since the act of simply clicking isn't really gameplay. But in Minecraft, you have game. There's quite a bit of game, as a matter of fact. The clicker aspect of mining is interesting, or at least it could be interesting, because you have to navigate as you do it. You create paths, you hunt through caves, you have a player with health and damage to consider, you're searching through minerals, all that jazz. And once you have your materials, you can use them however you want and for whatever you wish. It's very sandboxy in that way. Putting a clicker in Minecraft requires you to find a way to circumvent the sandboxy system of Minecraft in order to give the player a way to make number go big 
as simply as possible. One block randomizes the block that appears in order to allow the player to continue the sandboxy element of Minecraft in a different way, while also charting how many of each block has been dug. My friend's clicker map had a robust set of incremental goals that could be achieved by mining, but also through minigames and challenges. These required careful consideration so that the player is playing a game, not just sitting there in place waiting for things to happen around them. Pal World, at every opportunity, forces players to sit there, in place, and wait for things to happen to them. Okay look, it all comes down to your base. Because I found exploration so slow and unfulfilling, most of my time not spent capturing new pals or resource gathering was spent sitting at the base. There's lots to do here. You can build structures and contraptions to automate resource gathering. Pals can be assigned to complete tasks and deliver materials, the works. You have your technology tree that gives you all sorts of things to unlock and build at your base or tools that you can craft or gear for your pals. And this is what the process of making those things looks like. Yup. It's just waiting, waiting, waiting. Everything that you build or craft in your base has a value called work to it. Work is, as best as I can tell, the amount of time in seconds it takes to complete a task. If there's a machine you want to build, you find the location to set it down, hold down the craft button, and just wait. Crafting objects like tools or weapons works in the same way. For stuff in your base that you build, your player model will pretend to work in whatever direction they were already facing, and the translucent model of the object will fill from the bottom up. Tools can take 30 seconds or more to complete. If there's something you want a lot of, like arrows for a bow, then crafting could take 5 minutes or more, because each crafting instance stacks the work that is required to complete it. All of this time crafting is spent standing still, in place, holding down a single input, and waiting, waiting, waiting. By the way, right now you're watching me craft one of my first saddles, a Nightwing saddle, the one that lets you fly around with disappointing speed and limitations. This is one of the more work intensive things to be sure. You might also notice that, occasionally, a pal from my base will wander up and help me out. This is an interesting feature. Every pal has certain capabilities, certain kinds of work that it can do. Your water types can water plants, grass types can plant and harvest, fire types can cook. Some of your neutral types have a capability called handiwork, meaning that they can help with basic building and crafting tasks. You can assign a pal to a certain workstation, you do this by picking them up and literally throwing them at whatever you want them to focus on, but if you don't or if they finish what they're working on, they'll go into auto mode, searching for a task to complete. This is what you're noticing whenever a pal occasionally comes up to help me craft. Yes, we're still crafting that Nightwing saddle. They'll come up and bang on the workstation for a bit until something else catches their attention. Pals get hungry, bored, tired, they don't work at night, some tasks take precedent, and sometimes they just get grumpy. Which means that when you craft, it's you waiting for this to happen. I don't know if I somehow missed the optimal way to automate these processes. Honestly, I don't care. This mechanic is horrendous. Pal World wasn't designed as a game where you sit and wait for things to happen. It's not an idle game. You're supposed to be exploring, upgrading, catching, leveling up, shooting, playing. But instead, you're waiting. This is mandatory. You do not have a choice that allows you to skip any of this. You will craft, build, and gather. Which means that you will be waiting, waiting, waiting. Is this fun? Is this engaging? Is there anyone, anyone at all that liked this? Because this is the kind of thoughtlessly implemented mechanic that makes me wonder if a developer has even attempted to playtest their game. Look, I get it. This game is an early access alpha release. It makes sense that the mechanics aren't complete or haven't been implemented properly. There's still a lot of development to go. But how did this ever make it in? Surely the ridiculous time here has to be a bug, or else pals should be prioritizing something that takes a long time. If you build something in your base, you'll typically have many pals drop what they're doing to help you. Pals each contribute to the work number, meaning that multiple workers will make the process of building go faster. The same would be true of crafting, but as you can see, no pals decided to help me for longer than a few seconds here. You can, of course, assign pals to work at a station indefinitely, but, as best as I can tell, if a pal ever runs out of work to do, it will abandon its post to take a break, sleep, and go into auto mode. Though this inclusion is, again, mind-boggling, you could
could get around this in theory by allowing PALS to deliver work products from and to any inventory. As best as I can tell, however, this isn't possible either. PALS will always choose the closest compatible inventory, though the game does not tell you this. Here's an example. One of the first production machines you unlock in the game is the Berry Plantation. It's an early game farm that's really only good for food, but it's cheap and easy to build. It cycles through four stages of production. A planting stage, which requires a pal that can plant, a watering stage that requires a pal that can water, a growth stage that just takes time, and a harvest stage that requires a surprisingly separate skill of harvesting. Then, the pal that harvests brings the berries to wherever they can fit. For my first early game setup, the berries ended up in the feed basket. This was an okay result, but I really wanted to cook the berries. Cooking berries allows you to restore more hunger points for both you and your pals, as well as gathering a small amount of XP points. There's a few workstations that allow you to cook, but I wanted them to go into the campfire, the earliest cooking apparatus you unlock. Unfortunately, because mine was inside my home, and the game doesn't tell you how transferring items worked, I had no idea how to facilitate this. Relatedly, I found my base constantly littered with berries. This happens because if a high priority task comes along, like building a new machine in the base, then pals will literally drop what they're doing and join you. When they're done building, they'll find a new task to complete, leaving the berries on the ground. Was this really the best solution here? I feel like I could go on for hours, meticulously detailing every poorly implemented, thoroughly unconsidered mechanic that this game throws at you, but I don't need to. Because everything in this game, the survival elements, the pal catching, the action, it's all secondary. They aren't the reason to play the game. There's one singular mechanic that this game is designed around. My friend Z, who helped edit this script, has instructed me to remind you that this whole video represents nothing approximating facts. It's just my opinion, and you can totally disagree with it, we're still gonna be pals. Anyway, I talked earlier about my hate for fast travel incentives in games, but there's actually another thing that I hate in games. It's something that just about every game I've ever played uses. I bet every game in the world has considered it. In fact, it's something so omnipresent that most people don't even consider it unless it's particularly offensive. It's this the heads-up display or UI of a game. Any visual representation of something that is not a depiction of your surroundings or something that you have explicitly summoned to look at. I'll be referring to all of these elements as HUD. I'm what some might call radical anti-HUD in video games. One of the first things I do in any game is to look for options to turn off the HUD. In Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, I turned on the Pro HUD as soon as I got control. I even had a quip in one of my Tears of the Kingdom videos about how I was annoyed that the master mode in Breath of the Wild left that Triforce in the corner of your screen, and how the hearts were always there, even if you weren't in combat. Similarly, my Metroid Prime gameplay was always with the HUD's opacity turned all the way down to zero. That meant that, apart from the reticle, an element I begrudgingly accepted because of its utility in a shooter, I had nothing. I preferred to play with without knowing my current health, ammo, or even a mini-map, all because I wanted to be more immersed in the world. I love Metroid Prime, but the typical HUD is obnoxious, borderline offensive, so playing without it is a marked improvement. I highly recommend it. In my opinion, for games that have any wish to immerse their players in a world, HUD elements should be minimal and optional no matter what. I do understand that some players would rather have the information always available, but for me, I want to be immersed in gameplay. There are some games, though, that consider some mechanics important enough to display on your screen. I think Tears of the Kingdom implements its pro HUD in a perfect way. In most circumstances, nothing is there. If you start actively using stamina, your stamina wheel shows up and remains until it's fully refilled. If you get into combat, your hearts will appear. If you pick something up, there's a brief notification of what it is you acquired. Aside from these, the only non-world elements that appear on the screen are the menus that you summon. So, while we're thinking about this, let's see what PAL World has on its HUD and see how crucial the elements are for moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Oh. Oh no. We'll travel around the screen, clockwise, and identify the elements. 
On the top is your compass. This is Skyrim style, meaning that it's a straight line that identifies the points of interest in your immediate surroundings. You'll also get any boss health bars here if you're in the vicinity of one. On the top right, you have this screen that shows the status of the first five pals in your base. This only shows up when you're in your base, but is of limited value there because the status of each pal typically isn't something that you'll ever have a lot of control over. Even if you did, it only shows five pals. You'll quickly outgrow this number. Before you've completed all of your tutorial missions, this card listing the next three missions you have to complete will be displayed at all times. The right side doesn't have anything permanent, thankfully. This is probably because the two elements that surround it would have a tendency to bleed over it, so anything displayed here would almost certainly be covered. On the bottom right is the collection of what I might call actually important HUD elements, albeit with a lot of fluff. Your currently selected tool, palsphere variety, and palsphere count are all crucial gameplay elements when you're in combat. This display appears whenever you're either using a tool or have sent a pal out into the world, which is more often than I'd like, but is still okay. Why this is also showing a few controls, at different scales, as well as the version number, is beyond me. The bottom is where you'll see mounted pal controls appear. I don't love this. It feels like this could just show up as a tutorial the first time you mount a pal, or when you stop moving or something. Just adds to the bloat. The bottom left is the busiest section and has a fair bit of information. It's got your own current status of health and hunger, as well as the temperature and the time of day indicators. There's almost always a display showing you which key to press in order to begin building, something that never changes. Finally, you get a visual representation of what your lead pal is, what its types, level, and health are, the two pals that are next to it in the order, and what keys to press to rotate through them. All of this is unnecessary. Again, it could just show you this when you switch pals. The left side is where any status update messages appear. You'll get status updates whenever you or a party member eats something, sleeps, passes out, or when a pal in your base does literally anything, or if it's actively doing nothing. You will genuinely get messages like Kadava is slacking off, or Foxparks is grumpy and is going to bed, while you're halfway across the map fighting an alpha or something. Next, the top left corner is where you'll get information about your current party of 5 pals. If they get XP from anything, and just about everything gives you XP, this appears here. Finally, just about every pal, enemy, and interactable object you encounter in the world will have a contextual element hovering around it. This might show controls, or a pal's name, or an enemy's health, or anything else the game wants to display to you right now. Knowing what you know about me now, it should come as no surprise that I find this to be positively horrendous game design. HUD elements in PAL World combine to absorb something like 60% of the screen. And sure, there's not many situations where everything shows up, though if a raid of syndicate thugs or rabbit PAL strikes at your base, something that probably happens once every 30 minutes or so, you will see everything here. This is so intrusive. Still, I know that my opinions on HUD elements are in the minority. I am radical anti-HUD after all. So, if the game is built around all of these complex mechanics and informational access to each one is crucial, then even I will be hard pressed to fault their inclusion, even if I'd still rather them be toggleable. So, what is that singular mechanic that this game is designed around? Well, your goal in PAL world is to make every number go big. That is the game. You collect resources in order to build boxes to hold them and tools and machines to get more. You build a base to store those machines and resources that allow you to make your base bigger. You level up your pals and self in order to be able to catch more pals and keep more at your base. You catch pals to get more resources or even just to have more of them. Everything in the game is either part of or secondary to getting more stuff. There's a ton of complicated gameplay systems and mechanics that fill this game with the appearance of complexity, but they're all vapid time sinks, just fresh coats of paint on idle games. Your screen is filled with all of these elements, and none of them mean anything. You just catch pals and bring them home to do the clicking for you. You can travel on pals to make traveling less miserable, so that you can go further and get more resources to build things to click and pals to click them. Pal World is an idle clicker game disguised as Pokemon with guns. This is the peanut butter mint of it all. After joining the Little League team, playing baseball, putting up with my siblings, going to the stall, and ordering my two hugely incongruent favorite flavors, all I got out of it was a gross filler dessert. I didn't get a chance to enjoy any single element in it, as good as they could have been, and the result was pretty much terrible. I got nothing out of any of the individual experiences and, altogether, they were a complete waste of time. This game desperately needs a goal or a campaign or something to do. 
because in its current form, Palworld is just a confusing, empty mess of trails that all lead nowhere. You just keep making numbers go big until you get bored and move on. This is why I found this game so monumentally disappointing. I didn't mind that it was filled with Pokemon knockoffs, I actually sort of liked its combat, eventually made exploration non-miserable, and even could see myself enjoying the survival elements in the game if they were implemented with more care and respect for the player's time. But the fact that all of these mechanics don't go anywhere is simply unforgivable. I do hope that this game continues to get improvement and overhauls. We may be back here in a year talking about the fabulous renaissance of PAL world, but as it stands right now, this game is not worth your time. If you want to make number go big, go play an idle game. If you don't care about that, then go play a good game. You don't need to waste your time here. Thank you so much for watching this video. This one was a bit of a roller coaster. There was a good while where I was pretty sure that this video wasn't going to make it, but we pulled through. Big thanks to Z, as always, as well as Ryan for making this video possible. Oh, and my dad. Thank you for making me play baseball. I do want to let you guys know that I've started streaming semi-regularly, so if you want to get an early look at what I think of games or just want to hang out, then head on over to twitch.tv slash plays. Finally, please like this video and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. I'm always cooking up something, and North and South is still actively being worked on, I swear, so the best way to keep up with what I'm doing is to hit those buttons. But that's all I've got for you today, so enjoy your day and take care.